who doesn't love uh, faster software deployments and the ability to scale applications more quickly and the ability to have applications move more seamlessly through different stages of the development lifecycle in different environments? Everyone loves that, I think. Everyone that develops software loves that. And those are the top kind of reasons that we're hearing from our customers for adopting containers as that primary mechanism for delivering and deploying and running their applications. As the usage of containers starts to proliferate across these organizations, um, many of these companies are faced with a new set of challenges, which they've never faced before, primarily around the efficient and effective uh, placement and scaling of containerized applications. And we see many of our customers turning to container orchestration tools to help solve some of those challenges. A container orchestration tool, amongst other things, concerns itself with a few primary things. One of those is to understand the requirements of a given containerized application, and then place that containerized application on the best place within a fleet of or a cluster of EC2 instances to make the best use of those resources and provide availability and service to the, to the people that are consuming that particular application. AWS has been innovating in this space for a long time on behalf of you, our builders, our customers, um, to try and address some of these challenges with regards to container orchestration. It started in 2014 with the introduction of uh, Amazon ECS, or Elastic Container Service. This is a highly scalable, fully managed, secure, and deeply integrated container orchestration service. Um, those of you that have been paying attention to our releases and updates will know that at reInvent last year, our global conference, we announced the availability of a service called Amazon Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes, which is a fully managed control plane for the open source Kubernetes container orchestration tool. Now, both of these services provide you with a mechanism to deploy and schedule your containerized applications across clusters or fleets of EC2 instances running within your own environments. But the feedback we got from our customers is, great, but we like developing applications. We want to spend our time focusing on building cool features and servers and managing and patching those servers isn't really adding any value and differentiating us. So we listened to that feedback and at reInvent last year also, we introduced an exciting new technology called Fargate. And Fargate lets you deploy and schedule and uh, manage and run these applications, these containerized applications, um, without needing to worry about provisioning or configuring or managing or scaling clusters of EC2 instances. That capability currently exists with uh, ECS, or Elastic Container Service, and over the, the period of the, over the, the fullness of time, we expect also to bring that same capability to our managed Kubernetes service, EKS. So this is a Kubernetes session. We're going to deep dive into Kubernetes. I'm going to provide you with some tips and guidance and, I guess, field notes that we've picked up through talking to customers that are running Kubernetes on AWS. Before I dive into those specifics, though, who here has heard of Kubernetes? Good, everyone's heard of it. Who here is using Kubernetes? OK, good. Excellent. So I don't need to go too deeply into the 101 here, but let's just do a quick level set so we're all on the same playing field. Uh, Kubernetes, so it's a project that started out at Google a few years ago. Um, it's based, uh, a lot of the principles that it's built on top of are derived from a system called Borg that Google runs internally to orchestrate many of their containerized workloads. It is, as I said before, an open source container orchestration tool that concerns itself with the automated deployments and scheduling and scaling of containerized applications. In 2015, Kubernetes, the project, was handed off to the CNCF, or the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and they took that under their wing and managed the scaling and the community initiatives around that, and it's since gone on to be one of the most popular and highly used uh, open source projects that's available on GitHub today. Before I dive into my expert tips, I just wanted to take a quick step back and talk about something that I'm sure you will have heard of over the course of today, and that is the well-architected framework. Um, one of the pillars in particular appeals to me and I think resonates with what we're about to talk about, which is the operational excellence pillar. And you can see there are a few core design principles that, that are at the nucleus or at the core of every well-architected solution. And I believe, and, and my colleagues and many of our customers believe, that the combination of Kubernetes and AWS allows you to build a set of services or a solution on top of the platform that at its nucleus will have all of these core principles um, built into it, which means that you know, you're going to be able to scale and manage and have a lot of longevity and availability with the solution and service. And as we go through the rest of the slide deck, I want to call out certain areas where I think we're addressing some of these design principles, operations as code and annotated documentation and release cadences as well. See if you can spot them. So without further ado, let's dive into the top tips for the day. <laughs> 
My first top tip for today, and anyone, the, the, the people that put their hand up and said that they'd run Kubernetes, I'm sure this resonates with you before, but the top tip is never run uh, or never build a Kubernetes cluster the hard way. It's not a trivial task. Um, it takes a lot of hard work, blood, sweat, and tears, and, and it can be quite a painful process. And in all honesty, what are we having a Kubernetes cluster for? It's to run applications. So it's probably not the best use of your time. There are lots of tools available to um, some communities, some enterprise, and plenty of other options to help you deploy Kubernetes clusters and get on with the job at hand, which is building awesome applications and features for your customers. Some of the community ones that I wanted to call out early on were things like COPS, so Kubernetes Operations. That is a project that's closely aligned with the Kubernetes open source project itself. It's driven by the community. It provides a set of command line tools and configurations that allow you to provision resources and apply configurations to those resources to build a highly available uh, multi-AZ Kubernetes cluster. There are a few other open source tools there which I've talked about as well, Kube ADM and EKS CTL. Their EKS CTL specifically is a tool that helps you manage and provision um, a streamlined Kubernetes cluster using the AWS EKS service. At an enterprise or turnkey level, we're looking at things again like EKS, but Red Hat's OpenShift project as well, or product as well. This is a fully managed platform as a service which under the covers is powered by Kubernetes. And if you don't want to use any of those tools and you prefer to turn your hand to things like Ansible or Terraform or even native and naked cloud formation templates, those are also options for you as well. COPS is probably one of the more popular ones when we talk to customers that are deploying, excuse me, deploying Kubernetes clusters on top of AWS. Um, as I mentioned before, it is community supported. It's driven by the uh, special interest group for AWS. And if you're interested in learning more about that, I would recommend you pop along to either one of the community office hours that happens once a week or the Slack channel. You can get a lot of information around that. One of the things that I really like about uh, COPS as a utility is that it allows you to generate cloud formation templates or Terraform manifests which you can then use as a baseline for your own Kubernetes clusters. It might be that the opinions that COPS has about how things should be done don't necessarily align with your own. So you can generate these templates, you can tweak them and modify them, and use them to build your own best practice Kubernetes cluster. How easy is it to deploy a Kubernetes cluster using COPS? Has anyone used COPS, by the way? Excellent, OK. Well, this is how easy it is. Basically, it's a command line tool, and we specify a few parameters in there. We give it a name. We specify some availability zones. We choose some masters. And the masters, these are the parts of our Kubernetes cluster that really govern and control how our cluster and our applications behave. And we choose a few other bits of information there. We specify a configuration store. And then we hit go and enter. And within probably seven to 10 minutes, we'll have a fully operational Kubernetes cluster. That's great, it's perfect, it's wonderful. We have a cluster, we can deploy our applications to it, but there's still a long tail of work that has to go into managing and maintaining that cluster. We still have EC2 instances to manage. They have operating systems that need to be patched. We have logs that we need to analyze. We have an etcd data store that sits at the back that contains all of the configuration for our cluster. That needs to be highly available. It needs to be managed, it needs to be backed up, probably needs to be encrypted as well. So there's a lot of things that go into managing those clusters once they've been deployed. And again, we took that feedback and we decided to innovate on behalf of the builders, you guys, uh, and we introduced EKS, which, as I mentioned before, is a fully managed Kubernetes control plane for, for the open source project itself. Currently available in um, US East 1, US West 2, and um, as of recently, uh, Dublin. So, um, and, and hopefully it will be here in Sydney uh, in the not too distant future as well, so we can start to use that. What does EKS provide as a service? Well, it really just provides an endpoint for us. So we use that endpoint, we use our existing tooling. It might be that we're using our kube control command line utility or other tools out there. And we connect to that endpoint, and then we just start to interact with Kubernetes in much the same way that we'd interact with any other Kubernetes cluster. It is under the covers, native, bare bones Kubernetes. It's fully compliant to the Kubernetes conformance tests. Um, and we'll work and operate with most of the tools that are already out there today. As I mentioned before, we automatically deployed across multiple availability zones, so you have a highly available cluster configuration. Here's a more of a deep dive into what that looks like under the covers there. So we have our master nodes, which is where all the exciting stuff happens within the cluster. Then we schedule our tasks or our containers out to the outside world. We have our etcd instances, where our data, our, this is our data store, where our Kubernetes configuration is stored. And then we have our worker nodes, which are in our customer-managed domain. So we bring our own EC2 instances, we connect them to the cluster, and we schedule our workloads from there on in. So those are a couple of the options that are available to you specifically, and I would encourage you to explore some of those. Here's the process for deploying a cluster using EKS. Again, a very straightforward command line. We specify a few, uh, a few parameters in there, and within about seven minutes, we have an EKS cluster up and running. Has anyone used EKS yet? Has anyone deployed a cluster? Fairly straightforward to provision a cluster, right? Excellent. 
So just to check that no one had fallen asleep and everyone was listening, some pop quiz questions for you. And it's okay, I don't expect you to put your hand up and answer them, but uh, what are some of the community tools that are out there and that we're using today to deploy these clusters? Anyone? Yeah, COPS, there we go, Cube ADM, uh, EKS CTL, Kubicorn, which is one of my favorites because it's got a really awesome name. Um, so have a look. You, there's plenty of options out there for you. I would encourage you, um, maybe at least once in your life, as maybe a bucket list thing, to go and do it the hard way just to say you've done it, but um, I wouldn't go and do that for the long term. Um, what does COPS do for us? Well, it provisions infrastructure as well as the Kubernetes cluster components and configurations for us as well. So it lays out the instances and the resources that we need to actually run Kubernetes. It also allows us to create templates that we can use to provision and um, uh, orchestrate and author our, our own best practice clusters as well. EKS provides a fully managed what? Yeah, service, control plane. That's the answer I was looking for. <laughs> so this includes the highly available masters and the etcds. Yes, yes. Sorry, out you go. <laughs> so that's my top tips for um, deploying clusters. Um, don't do it the hard way. Use the tools that are available for you. And when EKS lands in Sydney, I would highly, highly encourage you to use that. The next top tip for you on your journey to building a Kubernetes cluster and deploying applications is to really think about your networking options. Now, one of the core design principles that Kubernetes lays out for us is that every pod, and for the purposes of our conversation today, we can think of a pod as a container, every pod has its own IP address and that all the pods in that cluster are able to talk to one another. And there are a few ways that we can achieve that very specific networking model. Um, click, 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 wrong button, there we go, ha ha. So one of the first mechanisms that we can use to attach our pods to the underlying network, which in our case will be a VPC, is something called CNI, which is Container Networking Interface. And this is an open standard of a pluggable architecture of components that we can use to wire a container to an underlying software-defined network. Kubernetes supports a wide range of CNI plugins, and each of these CNI plugins offers a variety of different uh, capabilities. Uh, here's an example of some of those CNI plugins. So if you're shopping around for an interesting way to connect your containers to the underlying VPCs, have a look at some of these. Um, just one point on that. Um, what is it that would make you choose one between, uh, sorry, one from another? Um, great question. I asked myself, awesome. Um, some of the reasons you might choose one over the other are the capabilities that they offer. Some of them require you to deploy an overlay network. Some of them require access to a persistent data store at the back end. Some provide a mechanism to micro-segment your containers uh, using network policies. So think about what it is you're trying to achieve and what your requirements are from a deployment compliance perspective and security perspective and potentially choose the CNI plugin that meets those requirements. One of the basic mechanisms for uh, orchestrating network connectivity within Kubernetes is kubenets, and this is the default mechanism that will uh, be enabled if you deploy a cluster using the COPS utility. Kubernetes is fairly simple. It doesn't provide any advanced capabilities, and it doesn't even handle the cross-node communication, which, as you remember from one of the core principles, is something that we need to do. What it does do is it uh, makes sure that every pod has an IP address, and then it will take the information about those IP addresses and populate the VPC route tables so that all of the other nodes within the cluster know where to find the, uh, the pods that exist across the cluster there. This is great, it works very, uh, very well, it's extremely performant and extremely simple to set up. The one drawback of, uh, of, of Kubernetes um, that we find our customers talking to us about regularly is that because it relies on the VPC route table, and the VPC route table has a limit of 50 routes per route table, you can actually only deploy a cluster of up to about 50 nodes. Now, for many organizations, that's more than enough, but for some organizations at the edge there, that might not be enough, so you might have to choose a different approach here. Something to be mindful of. One of the other mechanisms that you can use to address that particular challenge um, and, and a number of other challenges that I brought up on the screen here are overlay networks, and I briefly touched on that earlier on. Some of the CNI providers out there today require you to build an overlay network. So this is a network that sits on top of the existing VPC network and builds a mesh between all of the nodes within your cluster and adds additional advanced capabilities to, to, the, to the communication path or in the data path between the, the communication of the pods. Um, why might I use an overlay network? A common example I hear a lot from customers is I didn't size my VPCs or my subnets correctly. It might be at the time when you built your, sub your VPC and you sized your subnets and your VPC that you thought, you know what, I'm going to have hundreds of EC2 instances, which is a good, uh, a good target. But you typically have many, many more containers than you do uh, EC2 instances, thousands, tens of thousands. And... Um, the, the, each pod, if, if you recall from the rules and the design principles I talked about, requires its own IP address. 
So um, having a not enough IP space is a big challenge. So by using these overlay networks, we can actually build a much broader IP space for us to use uh, uh, for our container or pod IP addressing. And as I mentioned before as well, some of these overlay networks include additional functionalities. One of the really simple ones um, that we talk about with our customers regularly is Flannel. It's, a, it's an open source overlay network or a CNI plugin provider that builds an overlay network. Packets are sent between the nodes within the cluster or the pods within the cluster using packet encapsulation and VXLAN. Um, this is great. It's very simple to set up and works very, very well. Um, the only drawback of doing something like packet encapsulation is that there is a degree or a small degree of latency. And obviously, as you scale up and there's more network traffic, this can introduce a little bit of latency to, to, to cross-stack calling and, and application response times. So that might be something you need to think about when you're deciding if you want to build an overlay network or if you want to use another mechanism. Another challenge we find customers dealing with with overlay networks, because the, the packets themselves um, are encrypted or encapsulated, my apologies, not encrypted, they're encapsulated, it can be quite difficult to get insights into the data as it traverses the cluster. You might want to peer and have a look using uh, NetFlow-like NetFlow -like tools or VPC flow log like tools. Um, and with those packets being encapsulated, it's quite difficult to really see the true payload of those requests. So do we need to use an overlay network? No, we don't. There are lots of other options out there. I already mentioned KubeNet doesn't use overlay networks. It's a very useful option. Um, the other option that we're seeing customers turn to a lot more nowadays is something that we actually created um, in part to help us deploy the EKS service. And that is a CNI plugin that natively integrates with our VPCs. The way that this works is, oh, my apologies, a bit clicker happy there. The way that this works is for every node or instance that we provision into the cluster, it, we give it an, an elastic network interface. Um, we allocate multiple IP addresses, multiple secondary IP addresses to that elastic network interface. Every time a new pod or container is provisioned on that node, we then allocate it one of those secondary IP addresses. So then for all intents and purposes, the pods that are running within the cluster are just EC2 instances, and they're able to use the underlying VPC routing fabric to get from point A to point B for each of those requests. This is extremely performant. It taps into the native capabilities of the VPC uh, underlying fabric, and it uses um, the full, uh, full bandwidth and full capability of the underlying um, VPC fabric. So you know, we could be looking towards 25 gigabits per second. Um, extremely performant, as I mentioned before. No packet encapsulation. Some constraints. Um, so you're limited by the number of ENIs that we can attach to an EC2 instance and the number of secondary IP addresses that we can attach to those ENIs as well. That might be a consideration. Uh, if you want to look more into this VPC CNI plugin, I'd encourage you to hop, up, my apologies, hop along to the, to the link I've got there. This will all be sent out afterwards as well. So pop quiz time again. What do all pods in a Kubernetes cluster need? IP addresses, awesome. And they all need to be able to communicate. Uh, when you deploy a cluster um, using COPS, what is the default networking provider? Kubenets. Awesome. And why might I choose a CNI network plugin over another, one over another? Capabilities. Um, maybe I need an overlay network, maybe I need a data store, maybe I need some network policies to support that. OK, tip number three, role-based access control. Least privilege access, it's a core principle of well-architected solutions. Mm. Security at all layers and all levels. At AWS, everything we build uses IAM as a mechanism for authentication and authorization. EKS is no different. Um, one of the really awesome tools that was created by a partner of ours called Heptio is the AWS IAM authenticator for Kubernetes. What this allows us to do is to gate API calls to the Kubernetes API with IAM authentication. So if I'm an IAM user and I want to be able to make a call against the Kubernetes API, by leveraging the IAM authenticator for Kubernetes, I can um, control access uh, to that API, um, at least from an authentication perspective, using IAM. And you can see here the flow. Um, the request is made to the API. The API, which is essentially the Kubernetes master, makes a call to um, the AWS authentication service and validates that the credential or the token that I'm sending is a legitimate one and belongs to an identity that I trust and um, I'm, I want to allow into my Kubernetes cluster. That then gets passed back to the Kubernetes API, at which point then I'm handed off, in terms of an authorization of the request itself, to the Kubernetes role-based access control structures. And these are tables or rules that are defined within the Kubernetes cluster that govern what I can actually do within the cluster. Um, one of the really cool things that we can do through the use of this IAM authenticator for Kubernetes is we can bind IAM roles um, to Kubernetes roles. 
So I can allow a member of a group that has a, an IAM role associated to it to only perform a given set of actions within my Kubernetes cluster. It might be that I only want them to be able to read or list pods. Um, so here in this example, I may have an IAM role that's associated with a group for users that I want to be able to read um, the properties of a given Kubernetes namespace. In this case, and maybe I want to do uh, a set of pods. I only want my user to be able to read or list the pods that are available in a given namespace. And I can do that now using this, this IAM authenticator for Kubernetes. Um, by the way, that capability isn't limited to EKS. You can actually use that IAM authenticator with any other Kubernetes deployment that you're running on top of AWS as well. Um, and it might make more sense for you to normalize and kind of rationalize using one single source of authentication than to have multiple sources, relying on client certificate authentication, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and again, with role-based access control, I can go cluster-wide. So I can have a policy that permits access to cluster-level resources um, by having a role, again, associated to a Kubernetes role um, using a simple config map that we create. So a config map is a, a basic set of configurations or rules that we define. Uh, if I hop quickly back to my original diagram there, I can show you kind of what that looks like. So this is the config map specifically. I've got a config map here. You can see I'm specify, uh, specifying the on for a given IAM role. And then underneath that, I'm specifying a, um, a set of uh, identities that I want to bind the users that have that role associated with them too. And inside of that, then Kubernetes figures out what that user should or should not be able to do. It's almost time for another pop quiz in terms of our security. Here we go. Right, so uh, why should you enable RBAC on your Kubernetes clusters? Because we all want to do fine-grained access control, principles of least privilege. It's the right thing to do. We don't necessarily want to give everyone to do access to do all the things. And it's a property of a well-architected solution. And everyone here is well-architected, yes? Yes, Mitch. What is one of the best ways to authenticate requests to Kubernetes clusters that are deployed on AWS? Yeah, the AWS IAM Authenticator. Open source tool, now part of the Kubernetes project. Um, go along, have a look at it. It's really awesome. It works with clusters deployed um, on AWS, not necessarily just EKS clusters. And can you use an IAM group to control access to resources within a Kubernetes cluster? Yeah, we can. So we can bind those IAM roles to roles within Kubernetes to make sure that certain IAM users are only able to perform certain actions within our clusters. Right, tip number four. You're doing very well with the questions, by the way. Uh, observing all the things. Now, our clusters are extremely complicated beasts. There are lots of resources, lots of applications, lots of things emitting lots of interesting bits of data that we need to use and observe and, um, and learn from. Um, some examples you can see here on the screen, we've got logs, metrics, tracing information. Um, and the, given the dynamic nature of containerized environments, and what I mean by that is um, we typically don't have containers running for extended periods of time. Uh, I think a survey done by Datadog fairly recently showed that the average time or a lifespan of a container was, was minutes, you know, not hours, not days, not weeks. So the tools that we use to capture, analyze, collect, store, all of this information that gets emitted from these clusters and our applications need to support that type of dynamic nature. So let's look at one particular use case here. So we've got logs. Our logs are uh, being emitted not only from our application, but from the cluster itself, from the nodes, from the containers, and from our applications. So what are the, one of the things, what, what can we do to capture all that information and make sure that we have it for uh, future investigation to allow us to continually learn from potential operational failures, operational excellence design principle? This is an example of a log aggregator service or solution that was put together by um, some, of our, some of my colleagues um, from, uh, from the solutions architecture team in the US. And it uses something called the EFC stack, so the Elasticsearch, FluentD, and Kibana stack. So we're using a collection of different tools here to gather information from the clusters and the applications and aggregate all of that information into one spot, which is Elasticsearch. We're then going to visualize that information inside of uh, Kibana dashboard to help us make some decisions about what we should be doing next, where potential bottlenecks are, um, where potential throughput issues are, and where potential scaling issues might be as well. Um, the way that this works is we have FluentD, which is our log collector, deployed to each of the nodes in our cluster. We use a uh, 
construct in Kubernetes parlance called a daemon set, which is basically a set of containers that are deployed to each and every node within our cluster, irrespective of how many nodes we have. Kubernetes makes sure that is running there. So the logs are collected. They're fed into CloudWatch logs, which has a subscription into Elasticsearch. They then get fed into Elasticsearch, and we use Kibana then to visualize. And uh, who doesn't love a pretty dashboard up and around the office somewhere, right? Um, so that's logging. What else? What are the other things that we need to be really mindful and cognizant of when we're deploying applications or Kubernetes clusters? Well, tracing. I mean, we've got distributed applications running across our Kubernetes clusters, running across many, many nodes with many, many microservices and lots of other goodness happening, lots of requests coming in and going out. So we want to be able to trace those requests. We want to be able to trace the calls that are being made across that stack to understand if there are potential issues. There are lots of ways that we can do this. Um, one of the ways that is natively integrated into the AWS services right now is X-Ray. Um, so we can use X-Ray, we can embed the X-Ray SDK into our applications, and we can have that information emitted out into a centralized location, the X-Ray console, which is what I'm showing up on the screen here. And with that information, then, we can dive quite deeply into the specific behaviors of the applications as they're made across that service called Stack. Um, other great tools that are out there, so there's a blog post at the bottom there, by the way, if you want to go and have a look at how to do X-Ray on Kubernetes. Um, some really great tools out there that help solve this problem as well. Um, without you needing to make changes to your application code um, are things like uh, the service mesh concepts. Who's heard of service mesh before? I'm not going to dive too deeply into it, but go away, have a look at what a service mesh is, and understand the benefits of a service mesh and how they can help you solve some of these problems, especially for distributed applications and improving the reliability of the calls as they flow between these kind of highly distributed and dispersed application components. Back to the pop quiz. Uh, what are some of the traits required by a tool used to monitor Kubernetes? They should complement that dynamic nature. Again, we need to get the data off of those clusters, off of those containers, and we need to store it centrally so that we can use it for um, retrospective analysis and potentially future behavioral, um, sorry, future, future architecture decisions. Why is it important that we capture the log information from the cluster? Well, that data is invaluable in helping us learn from those operational failures, which I kind of alluded to earlier as well. The information there is going to give us guidance around how our application is behaving, perhaps things that we might need to change with our current configurations to, to address potential problems. And what are some of the tools that we can use to store, capture, and analyze information from the Kubernetes clusters? I talked about one, which is the EFC stack. Um, there are lots of other great partner solutions out there today. Datadog, Sumo Logic, um, New Relic. Um, some of the people are out there in the, uh, in the expo hall. Some of the partners are out there in the expo hall today. So I encourage you to pop along and have a chat with some of those people and understand um, if their solutions meet your requirements. Last tip, number five, build, ship, and run. I mentioned that customers are using Kubernetes to deploy, manage, scale their applications. And obviously, we need a mechanism to reliably deploy applications. And Kubernetes is going to help us scale those applications. It also has some capabilities that help us reliably deploy those applications. And we'll talk more about that shortly. Um, there are lots of tools that can help you achieve application deployment within your Kubernetes clusters. Um, what I'm sharing with you here is a reference architecture um, that uses the AWS code um, deployment services and code development services to actually create container images and ship those container images off into a Kubernetes cluster. So the workflow looks like this. The developer, let's call him oh, Mitch, and he's writing some software. He commits that code into a code commit repository. The uh, changes are detected through a CloudWatch event. That triggers then a workflow which is orchestrated by the AWS Code Pipeline service. That Code Pipeline service then triggers AWS Code Build to build, um, so first of all, pull down the source code, but then build a Docker-compliant container image. Um, once that container image has been built, um, the image is then pushed into Elastic Container Registry, which is our managed S3-backed, highly scalable and secure container registry service. Once the image is pushed into ECR, uh, we then trigger the next step in the workflow, which is powered by our good old friend, uh, AWS Lambda. Lambda reaches out to the Kubernetes API and says, I have a updated image I need to apply to a current deployment, deployed application within your environment. It takes the properties of that deployed or updated application, specifically the updated container image tag ID, and pushes it into the Kubernetes cluster and says, please um, update yourself as a deployment to use the latest version of this image, which can be retrieved from location X, which is typically um, AWS Lambda. In the example that we've got here as well, you can see there's a call out down to a key and to what we 
uh, the icon represents his parameter store. And in this scenario, what Lambda is doing is it's going and pulling out the secret material from the parameter store to get the, uh, which it uses then to authenticate itself against the Kubernetes API. So in this scenario, we're using client certificate-based authentication. If you were to use the um, to the, the EKS service, or if you're using the IAM authenticator for AWS, uh, the client libraries for the Kubernetes, um, the Kubernetes client libraries uh, support the ability to call um, through the uh, through a uh, programmable interface, the IAM authenticator for Kubernetes, and you can make calls then directly to the EKS service uh, via that mechanism. Uh, the reference architecture is a blog post. It's available online, so uh, I would encourage you to pop along and have a look at that. Final pop quiz of the session. Why is it important that we deploy frequently and deploy small reversible changes? So that's fairly obvious, I think, for most people. It's important that we can quickly roll back in the event that there are some issues with our deployment. Having small and frequent ones, small, small frequent deployments, it's easier for us to troubleshoot and diagnose potential issues that might occur because of a change that we've introduced. What are some of the built-in capabilities of Kubernetes that can help improve reliability? Now, I didn't talk about this. Uh, those of you that use Kubernetes probably know the answer to this. Those of you that don't probably don't. Um, Kubernetes has this concept of deployments, and to support these deployments and the deployments of the containers, it has these concepts of uh, liveness and readiness probes. These probes will run against the containers that you deploy to ensure that they are actually healthy and active before they can start servicing um, user requests. So by having those liveness and readiness probes configured as parts of your deployment, you ensure the, the reliable upgrade and deployment of your latest versions of your application. It means that potentially uh, potential users that might be trying to access the service don't have a bad experience. And uh, what are some of the tools that can help me deploy software to my Kubernetes cluster? I gave you one example up there, which is a service, a solution built using the AWS code deploy components. Um, there are some awesome, awesome, awesome tools out there. Um, a large majority of the community is getting behind Jenkins. Jenkins is a great tool. Lots of people are using it to deploy software into Kubernetes clusters. Helm is a great package management tool to, to consolidate all of the Kubernetes resources that you might need to run your application and package them up and deploy them in a single command line. Gitkube, Scaffold, Draft, there's, there's so many of them. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about that, hop along and have a look at the, uh, the special interest, the application special interest group's recent survey they sent out. And there's a list of something like 180 community-driven projects that can be used to deploy software into a Kubernetes cluster. Um, if you want to learn more about mechanisms for deploying software into Kubernetes clusters, this is a GitHub project that was put together by one of my colleagues, Arun Gupta, who's based in the US. And he walks you through a bunch of exercises um, to set up and deploy a specific application using both uh, Kubernetes, EKS, ECS, and AWS Lambda. So you can get a feel for the different types of toolings and the approaches that can be applied there. So in summary, um, I would say make sure you think about and consider all the options available to you for deploying your Kubernetes clusters before you try and do it the hard way. And please try not to do it the hard way if you can really try and avoid it. Make sure you understand what your networking requirements are. Networking is a very complex subject. There are lots of moving parts, and there are lots of components that need to go together to make your networking, uh, to, to network your, your applications within your Kubernetes cluster. Understand what you need to do, understand what the options are, and choose the appropriate solution to address your requirements. Make sure we're capturing, analyzing, storing, assessing, using all that log information to guide future decision-making processes, but also to troubleshoot and diagnose runtime um, situation and, and potential issues. And ultimately, make sure that we're always striving for operational excellence. And as you've probably seen as we've gone through this, a lot of the components of Kubernetes and coupled with the capabilities of AWS, we're ticking off many of those design principles that I talked about in one of the first slides um, of the session. Some extra things for you if you want to take some photos of this, and I think the stuff will go out via the, uh, if you scan your badge on the way out, you can get access to these things as well. But there's a really great workshop, guide you through provisioning Kubernetes clusters using COPS on AWS. Lots of breakout labs that you can go through there, learning how to do things like the F stack, auto scaling of uh, applications and clusters, configuring log and telemetry, um, sorry, tracing capabilities. Um, and then a deep dive into the networking capabilities of EKS that I'd previously talked around as well, which is our VPC CNI Kubernetes plugin. With that, I'm going to stop talking now. I think I spoke at 100 miles an hour there. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming. Uh, please provide feedback. We're always looking to try and improve these sessions. So yeah, feedback is, is greatly appreciated. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the day.